It's my, my pleasure to welcome you to the second uh, appointment of the Digital Crisis Seminar, which is the keynote. We have a keynote every year. Uh, normally we do it on the first appointment, but this year was possible to do it only on the second. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce uh, Leif Scheuer from the uh, Center for Information Modeling at the University of Graz, who will be presenting about our approaches towards genuine digital hermeneutics. Uh, and life has a background in classics and information technology, information systems, digital humanities, and combines them together in research. I will leave it to you. Thank you, Matteo. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Hello, everybody. I was uh, one and a half year already for a month in Berlin with the Topoi uh, project, and they invited me for my uh, ancient studies on spatial perception. But now uh, I'm working, in this time I was wor working at the uh, classics department and then I changed, now I'm in the DH department, which is the um, center of information modeling. Just a few words on myself to, to understand how I was working. Therefore, I, I have it here. I started uh, with philosophy and history and in the same time, I was working for nuclear scientists, programming for them. So I came from both sides and I studied also a little um, in spatial informatics, geoinformatics, so I could combine this theoretical view from the IT part with a theoretical view from the history part and then uh, my sociological and philosophical studies, which I also uh, could deepen in the Max Weber Kolleg at Erfurt, where we had a lot of talks in sociology and um, philosophy. So just an insight, who wants, if anyone wants to know more about our Austrian Center for Digital Humanities, feel free to look at the homepage. We have a real large, wonderful um, asset management system in which we store all our projects. At the moment, it's about 25 projects we stored there. But let me come to what I want to talk to you to this evening. You see, half of the talk I will give uh, is under the headline of definitions. And this is a major part I want to do with you. I want to ask the central question that I aren't asked a lot. What is digital? What is humanities? And part of this, what is the methodology of hermeneutics? And then I want to go a little in the technical and practical side to ask what are digital aided humanities uh, um, as a other term. <laughs> what do we need for digital hermeneutics or genuine digital humanities and how could this implement it technically? So let's start with some definitions on DH. Here I have a definition from Julie Thompson Klein um, from uh, where you see interdisciplining digital humanities. And there she says, the age now encompasses a wide range of methods and practices. And then she shows what methods and practices are included. I will give another example soon, what she means with that. Another one, Rafael Alavredo, he says, there is no agreement on theory, methods, professional norms and criteria of evolution, but only a genealogy a network of family resemblances among professional schools for methodological interests and preferred tools. So it's a quite wide range of people who are somehow brought together without any um, methodology that bases themselves. And therefore, here again, Julie Thompson Klein gives an insight what is all included in digital humanities, starting with computer linguistics, uh, digital collections, um, and then things like cultural impact of the internet or teaching and learning and so on. So it's a really broad 
wide range we have here. And then there is Hume with his is odd problem because something is. That doesn't mean that it ought to be like this. So we should ask ourselves if we really want to have a discipline of digital humanities on its own, what is it and how is it? And therefore, I think we need to discuss some really important words and their meanings. The first question is, what is digital? And of course, first of all, we look at Wikipedia. Everybody who does this, everybody says we don't do it, but we do it. And here you say digital usually refers to something using digit, particularly binary digits. So it has to do with fingers. We do something with fingers in all of this. And afterwards you see lots of technologies where this word is used. It doesn't bring us any further. It's the same that we have this large word digital and we don't know what it is all about. And even when we go in um, the wiki, um, wiki dictionary here, it is said that it is a, a borrowed term from Latin and that it has to do something with digits, as I said, with fingers or toes. Performed, things performed with the finger, but then it goes on. It has to do with discrete, binary uh, numbers and uncontinuous things. And here we go a step further. So we all know it's something about computing, but what is it all about? And therefore we have to go a little deeper in the basics of computing. Many of these things I will tell you, you will already know, but you should really have it in mind. The first thing is that it is based on zero or null and one. So you only have this two possibility, which means it has to be on one hand exact, your data has to be exact and be unique, what we call in German ein eindeutig. Now we think about historical data, now we think about textual data and so on, and we get the impression that there is no digital humanities possible at all. Let's go on. It has to be describable in infinite, uh, infinitely many steps, which means it has to be algorithmic. An algorithm is clearly um, clear statements which define step by step your doings um, to a point that it has to stop. This is what we call the Halte problem. It is based on electronic impulses, at least at the moment, and this means it is in deep thought, not physical. Of course you have your computer standing there, and of course you have some kind of storage systems, but the storage system itself is not the information system. It's only a very part, and um, you couldn't do anything with this piece of material if you don't have the, the, um, the ideas behind it. So it's not the physical things, but it is um, the impulses, it's the electronics, and therefore it's temporal. That means it's always depending on a time scale. And it is a representation instead of a presence. So we always do representations in this kind. And of course it's computer based, which means you have to have an IPO principle. Everything we can do depends on input, processing and output. And um, to go a little deeper there, it has to be describable in a Turing machine, which means in a, in a Ford model, uh, which gives an idea how to make algorithms. This is something, um, especially in the age, it is not discussed a lot. We are not talking about uh, algorithms, we are not talking about Turing machines, but we should really start thinking about that too. But let's go to digital in a wider sense. Um, there is the RAND Corporation, which is a think tank 
opened after the Second World War in the USA, and the uh, Rand Corporation had in the 50s one big question. What to do if there is any nuclear attack on America? How can we store the data that the data survives somehow? The idea was we have to have five or six different places where the data has to be stored and the data has to be the same. And this is a big problem because when we talk about temporality, when we talk about place, this data never is the same. <laughs> And this is what Barron talks about in his study a lot. He says it's an utopia of same time and same space. This was the starting for the ARPANET, and the ARPANET later was um, the, 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 the father of the Internet. So all we do in the Internet when we think about IPs, when we think about uh, packages and all this stuff, is we try the utopia of same time and same space. It is distributed and networked, which seems to be quite clear at the moment, but this means it is somehow diagrammatical. That means we have two things on different places that are in the same place in the same time. This is the big problem we have when we're working on uh, IT systems, it is an utopia we try to somehow to get near to, but we'll never reach that. But when you look like here on a diagram, you see lots of things at the same time that are connected somehow to each other, different to a text in which you read from left to right or from right to left, depending on which language. Here you have many things at the same time in same places connected, networked somehow together. And of course, it's also an illusion. You don't look at every point in the same time. You look at one thing and you go on and on. But the illusion is that you have, or the utopia behind this, that you have here the same time. And it's modular. Other things that seem also very uh, clear to us, it's that it's multimedia. So we have different kinds of media. And media for me is a text, is a picture is some kind of uh, um, animation. The media is not the screen. So this is just different ways of talking. We have to also to think about this. And it is interactive. It is not um, web-based only. It could be uh, also in a local net, or it could be also only on one computer. And cloud computing is part of what we call um, Web 2.0, but this is mainly kind of a um, business plan to get data, but not part of the digital, in, even not in its broader sense. So much for the question, what I mean with the word digital. Then, humanities, what are humanities? We are always talking about there are um, faculties of the humanities and there are some languages in it and there are arts in it and history and so on. And it's more a conglomerate of different uh, branches or different um, scopes brought together because you don't know where to put it. But this is not what humanities actually are. Humanities is a debate of the idealism of the 18th and 19th century. And there was the big differentiation between the natural science and humanities. And this is the difference between natural laws and human experience. And this experience is genuine did, uh, historical. Also, the differentiation between monothetic, so based on general rules research, and ideographic, so unique historical individuals that were somehow thought of. And the humanities are, first of all, experience-based, and second, ideographic. And there are two fields of the humanities that are very important. One is the given sources, so how to work with um, the sources you get from um, history, 
And on the other hand, the question of how are they connected to each other? What is the nexus? So Jan Kroos and I last year um, made an article of, about um, information systems as a discipline and uh, digital humanities, and I tried to give a definition of the humanities as an approach of the humanities as well as the neo-Kantian ideographic inquiries and Casiro's facts of cultures based on objective different sources depending on the mains of independent disciplines as well as the idea of Zusammenhang comprised fundamental de demarcation of the criteria of humanities understand as human studies. So much for a definition. And the major um, idea behind the humanities is the methodology of hermeneutics. Therefore, the last question is, what is hermeneutics? We start in ancient times. It is the um, art of Hermes, so the god of, in their form, translation. Hermenois is important. So he brings the will of the gods and he invented the language. This is only one thing. We don't know where the, um, the word hermeneutics actually derived from. We know it first um, from Plato, who speaks about hermeneutic. Uh, Techne, you see it's not an arete, but it's techne, so it's some kind of a craft, a handwork. And here, sorry that I only gave the English version of it, is a part of the seventh later, uh, letter of Plato where he um, describes what hermeneutics are. So after much effort as names, definitions, sites, and other data of sense are brought into contact and friction to another. This is the collection. This is the work with the sources. In the course of scrutiny and kindly testing by men who proceed to, by question and answer without ill will. And then is the second point of hermeneutics that are even more problematic for us. With a sudden flash, there shines forth understanding about the very problem. So there is a sudden flash, the heurika moment where it says, oh, that's it. Now I got an, kind of an insight what I was talking about. And this is how uh, humanities are working. We are not looking at laws in a kind of um, the natural science, but we want to understand how people work and we want to get in contact with them. So hermeneutics as a methodology we're working on is much depending on this heurika moment. When you go to the medieval exegesis where it was then uh, continued, you have two basic fields of exegesis. One is the Roman modern law and the other thing is the Bible, which is quite normal for medieval times. And it is a succession of Augustine or Origenes, which then goes on with this quatuor sensu scripture. So you have four, uh, a fourfold meaning of the text. So the Bible it can be literal, it can be theological, it can be current, important for the current uh, individual and eschatological. And Friedrich Schleiermacher took this and brought it a step further. Um, he says, every single thought has to be interpreted in the context of the whole life experience that arose from it. So there are two levels. One is the linguistic one, where you look what the text is and the text in the text and so on. And the other is the context of the author. The text is only an expression of experienced world and not reality. 
So experience is now the big word and the key to go to this and this Plato moment is empathy. Also a word that is very difficult to, to get it somehow into a digital world. And one of the scholars who worked a lot on Schleiermacher was Stiltai. And he made now this distinction between natural science and humanities, which is by him called human studies. And he says it's the difference between explaining on one hand, this is natural science, and understanding. And understanding is something totally different to explaining. Humanities construed on perception and cognition would be a physical fact and a such topic of natural science. It only becomes a topic of, for the humanities when human being is experienced. The experience comes into expression in a manifest of life and this manifestation again is to be understood. This is the hermeneutic circle we always go. What we want to do when we work on ancient histories, we want to understand how people lived. We don't want to make natural laws or something. We want to understand how they felt, how they are. We want to bring us in a connection to them. And this connection is step by step on reading, understanding, combining it with our world to get a view and to translate what the sources tell us. And this is, at the end, what Paul Ricoeur then says, um, human acting is kind of a text, an unfinished open oeuvre whose sense is kept in suspense. This is, of course, something when we look at history. The oeuvre is closed. The people are dead. Especially the longer they are dead, the more closed this case is. But on the other hand, we lose that many informations on that case. This is the problematic thing on ancient history. But it is how we call it, nae ferne, the near um, far. Understanding for Ricoeur and also for me is kind of a translation to get to sources and to, to translate them in our world to understand them. And there is always more than one way of these constructions and reconstructions. And when we thought about zero and one, and then there are more than two ways on constructions and reconstructions, then we get into the big problems we have with digital humanities. So one short summary um, on humanities and on the question of hermeneutics. It's not only a method, but a, a philosophical position, the relationship between humans and their environments. The world is understood, as I said, except, uh, instead of um, and experienced. So it's understood, not explained. The scope is the experienced world, its representation, and the understanding of this experience. And this circle somehow we have to bring into the digital world. The process of hermeneutics is a translation and this is what we have to present somehow. We shouldn't think about kinds of um, empirical studies or something. In computing, courses, empirical studies give the expressions of natural laws. Perhaps these laws are somehow right, and computer linguistics can give me a good grammar, but they don't give me any experience. Because this experience, again, is kind of translation I do, and I have to represent this digital. Just a very short excuse uh, to end with this. When we think about hermeneutics as understanding of meaning and information, which is for information technology one of the basic uh, terms, as a process, a process to translate experience into words, then the topic of information is the topic of 
hermeneutics. And IT in this side is a science of information processing, so it is kind of um, humanities. And when we think of information systems in a large scale, information systems are not only computers and codes, but they are people, they are uh, processes, they are understandings. How can it be that someone in Japan with a total different worldview programs something and I can understand it? I can work with it somehow. What frictions are there? How they are combined? I think these are very, very important big questions in this world that is somehow uh, brought together in the same space and the same time as an utopy. So what are we doing with designers, programmers, users and their experienced worldview? But this is only an excursion on things. I'm quite sure uh, the um, information systems as a discipline is very working hard on that. So digital humanities, question mark. On one hand, it is humanities in digital media. So representations of thoughts. But this can't be all. And digital human hermeneutics, the question is this a contradiction. When we think about be unique, exact, algorithm, algorithmic, so finishable, and then we think about experience, understanding, and the ongoing work of this circle. So the question is, how can we bring it together? What could be a genuine digital hermeneutics? And here, I want to show how we work at the moment uh, with computers in, for example, history. We start with a question, and then we go into the internet, we go to search engines, we go to Google or to Wikipedia, and then we go to digital editions, and look all the stuff. Perhaps we go to local applications or even we take a book and read. And then we have something in our mind. Then we drink a coffee or a beer with a friend. We have a chat about that. And then we sit down and write a text. And if we are lucky, we take this text and uh, make a PDF and put this PDF back, to, uh, back in the internet. This is a little uh, humoristic thought on how we are working at the moment. This, for me, is digital aided humanities. And it's not a bad thing. It is an important thing that we do it and that people do it. But it's not digital humanities. It's digital aided humanities or computer based humanities. So, digital hermeneutics, the experience of the world in representation and, again, the understanding of this experience in a digital media. What do we need? We need kind of a workflow uh, in which we can start working on this. So I want to take a tool, I want to take some data, I want to combine it somehow together. This is one important thing to make the hermeneutic circle actually digital. And the next thing is we have to document our research process. I have to write down what I'm doing there. If I have a kind of a research environment and I can say, let's take a map from there, let's take this data and let's take, for example, a network graph. I put it together and say, oh, this graph has here a nice spot. I want to have a look at this. I put at this, then it changes my data and it changes my other view. They have to be combined together. I will go on this a little later, but I have to document this process. I have to somehow write down or lock how these processes are working. And still, the hermeneutic process happens in the mind of the people. That is clear. I can't make a genuine digital hermeneutic as such. It is an utopia. I can represent and present, which is the main idea of computing. I can present and represent the thought and the way of working, the research of the people in a digital medium. So what do we need? We need components for data acquisition, 
including the unrestricted use of any existing data. Here we are in the question of ontologies on standardized interfaces. Then any number, and of course this is ideal, any number of different forms of analysis and visualization and the documentation and visualization of the research process. So, go a step further. We need modularized applications for data acquisition and analysis based on existing standards. So existing standards are very, very important. If you code anything, if you take any data, make any data acquisition, never do it without using any kinds of standard. CI doc for objects or TI for texts or um, any other kind of status, but use standards. That's the most important thing. If you don't do it, your data will be dead in about two, three, or four years. Then the next thing, we need a kind of a platform as a middleware. I know this is a, a term used in uh, IT very narrow. I take it a little broader. So we need kind of integration platform in which we can pack this all together. And we need kind of an ontology to describe the research process. Last thing is the most uh, difficult yet. And we should do it in a way that no further programming skills is needed. When I think about many colleagues, uh, professors who are now going in five to 10 years to retirement, they will not start programming. They will not start um, somehow working with this. They want to do it without any skills needed. They want to say, I take this, I take that. They want something like um, Word or something like PowerPoint they can work with where they have an idea from. So please, we should never make things so that normal, ordinary researchers, scholars of the humanity can use it. What are the chances of what I'm thinking of? There are new forms of analysis I'm thinking of. One very, very important thing is the question of exploratory work, which means I have a data set, I think of, let's see it in a map, and I, I see something, and I don't know what I see. I think, oh, let's look at this, and I'll go further, and I'll go further. This is exploratory. Also, a very important word for this is serendipity. I see something somehow, and I can't explain it. I go on with that. There's some, something in the pattern that is just not suiting, and I don't know what it is, but I can look at this. The big thing about the computer is it, that it makes everything very, very fast. This is the only thing computer really gives us. I could do the whole uh, things with maps, for example, by drawing the maps. But I would use hundreds of years to draw all the maps I've done already in the last five years, just because I sh uh, had to repaint and repaint and repaint the whole map all the time. So the big thing about computing is that now I'm faster. Another important new Part of analysis is the simulation. And I think this is something um, for the future in five to 10 years, we will think a lot, of, a lot more about um, simulation and how to work with this, how to build model and to put existing data into the model and see if the model suits or not. This is what the simulation is all about. Then, of course, collaborative work, such a platform should help me and my colleagues to work, really work together, which means I have kind of an argumentation and he goes from another side with another question and combines it and we cross each other. So you get a network of research here, really brought together in a platform. And then there will be or should be new narratives for the humanities which means the texts are not like in a book, 100 pages, and you read it. 
but they are modular, they are much smaller, and they are combined in networks. And of course, these networks are not only in texts, but they are in a broader sense. There is a network of sources also who refer to each other. And of course, there are pictures um, that go on and so on. So we, we also have to use the existing data when we make these texts. I had a problem with, with a part of Varro's um, Lingua Latina in which he talks about a Forum Piscarium uh, two months ago. Then I looked at the handwritings. That they were uh, by the Library of Florence. You had the handwritings in the internet. So I was able to look at the handwritings and I was able to look at all the editions and I could show that it was just a misinterpretation of the 19th century and there is no Forum Piscarium near the Tibur not in Varro's text. But this means now, with the new media, I can look at all the sources and I can represent the sources in my text. I have a text, I click there on my argument, and then I get all the sources listed up and I can show it really by the sources. This is something new, which was not possible before. This is the direct integration of sources. Yeah, I come to my last point here, the question of a technical implica uh, implementation of this. And of course, I haven't made the big system yet. It's not ready, but we have um, steps uh, worked on this and they started really early. They started in the 1980s. Um, the idea of this first um, synthetic media architecture was to make blocks of code that could be combined very quickly. So the idea of um, this Japanese company was that people who are not in a deeper sense able to program can build their own software just by combining this stuff. So you have modularized code that is somehow described in an algorithmic form, so you know what this code makes, and then you just put it in and plug it together. And one important thing on this is that, from an architectural view, there is no difference between documents and tools. And then you could think about something like a PowerPoint or a Word in which you build your own applications in this. And of course, it reduces costs. And um, when you think of um, the newest technology when it comes to components or other uh, parts of this, this is what the companies now are doing. Uh, I know a, a friend of mine who works in a large IT company says there are only very small groups of developers who have their very strict topic and they program on this and then they are just put together in different projects. So you have a lot of projects and you have a lot of small, very modularized, uh, different parts of codes and they were just combined and mixed together to make a new kind of software. And this is the same idea. It was made to um, reduce costs and this is how it works at the moment. So now um, this is the problem with it. What you have is kind of primitive elements. They have to be coded. And then you have combine, uh, compound elements and they are built together like these Lego blocks, built together by different components. And this is then really easy. You take the one thing, you take the other thing, you combine it via an interface and you get a compound um, element and can go on with that. The big question is the communication via standardized interfaces. And there again you think about ontologies. Because you have to think about how can I define the, the, the places where I get the data in. It doesn't make sin to, sense to uh, take place names and to put it in a timeline. This is nonsense. So it must be clearly this lot 
is for time, this slot is for places, and so on. And there is another idea that is called a wrapping and knowledge federation, which means we have so many things in the internet. We should use that. We also have so much code already made. We should use it. What do we do? We make some kind of a concord around the existing data, defining the interfaces, and taking the data inside as kind of a black box. So we put in just the interfaces, and then we can, can combine them however the code inside is. And there, when we go a step further, we should make these wrapping elements even generic for the TEI, for CI doc, and so on. Then you can combine the whole Europeana into your system with drag and drop. This would be the idea behind that. And of course, important again is locking. So this description of this research process of bringing things together. Every action here has to be understood again as a primitive entity or as one of these elements. And the sequences of these can be understood again as compound entities or elements. So just an idea. This was made with a system called Webbles. I don't know if I will use that further. We'll see here. I made myself a data acquisition. I have a database connector, which goes to my existing database. Then I have a text field, easy, and I have input fields. And they are all connected somehow together very easily, just by standardized interfaces. And so I can build the workflow Without any programming, you can make such a thing. And then you make the visualization, for example, in the text, and you combine it just easy with a map that is existing as uh, one of these elements. Or you can say, no, I want it easy in kind of a um, table where then I can uh, make my analysis, for example, here statistically. They are all combined to each other, which means when I change something in the text, it changes the picture and it changes, for example, um, here my table. And if I, for example, take out these, the text would change again. I wouldn't have all the texts into, but only a few of them. And then I can start again. Okay, I just want to see all objects um, that are some kind of district. So they only shows me this and so on. This is what you do with GIS normally, but here you can go a step further. And here, for example, you take only this part and says, show it to me, and I have it. And I say, okay, use another database. I combine it with another database, and here I have a total different kind of data that can be combined because the data, the interfaces are standardized. And of course, I have the logging. And just the idea how such a logging could look like. This is now um, kind of elements with their attributes and another kind of elements. And then you can have it, for example, here in um, in, a, in an XML um, form. And again, I would say we don't want to read these XML forms. Let's do it in kind of a graph. Let's do it here. And there you have it. Again, I can show it bigger. For example, you have, no, you can't see it. You have fear free. TI encoded texts. Uh, this is Veres 1 and 2 and Catalina by Cicero. And you combine it here. And then you go on. Let's take, for example, the Augustian Rome map and we put it together. And on the other hand, I can make here an SQL questioning. And I get here a query on. I can't read it now here. 
So I can get a query and I can combine them again, make other queries, and so on. It is very short, uh, uh, small. I can um, tell you what I made in this at the moment directly. But this is how such a, a workflow could work. And then I could say, so we take the whole workflow, but we don't use Ciceronian data. Now we use, for example, Salis Catalina. And see what happens if I do the same questions, the same workflow on different data. And I could make different maps and can combine them. This is what I think are first steps on which then we can work exploratory and think about this could be kind of or an approach to uh, digital hermeneutics, as I think it could be. And then we could really think about not only presenting sources in the internet or digitally, but now we can start working historically as historians and start argumenting, start working with this kind in a new way, in a new kind of history. So much for my ideas. It's a lot of things to be done on that, but I think um, it is at least interesting to work on that. Thank you. Last but not least, some um, advertising. The um, AGE has an annual conference this year. It's in Leipzig. It's not so far from here. Uh, on the 21st and 24th of November uh, at the University of Leipzig. And it will be really interesting to see new changes or new developments in digital history. <laughs>